Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our evening session of International Couples Virtual Conference 2021. We want to welcome you from all over the world and we ask you to share this broadcast with your family, your friends and your loved ones. We want to thank Archbishop Asa Gurupira and Apostle Mavis Gurupira for affording us this time to come together and be consolidated. We also want to thank the hosts of this conference, DP Charity Jarare and Apostle Newman Jarare. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from our Dr. Archbishop Asa Gurupira, who is leading a thriving church and a visionary of Faith in God Ministries International, leading over 165 assemblies all over the world. The highlight of his ministries has been leadership development, mentorship, spiritual welfare, and marriage enrichment. He is married to Apostle Mavis Gurupira, who is a dedicated and ordained minister of the gospel. They are blessed with three children who are the crown of their union. We want to hear from Archbishop on telling us on how to consolidate our marriage in the season of consolidation. Over to you, Archbishop. Special greetings in the name of our soon coming king. My wife and I are excited to come to you from Rusike, Zimbabwe. We want to thank God. Uh, we are right in our rural home. Um, welcome to all couples in Faith in God Ministries International and also couples in other churches who happen to tune in at this time. Welcome to a time when we are speaking about consolidating the marriage institution. I want to thank God for all the speakers that have gone before me. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff that the Lord has given you and I. We thank God so much. Uh, my wife also spoke and uh, I want to thank God that uh, we are not just speaking, in, in particular she was not just speaking from, you know, head knowledge. We are speaking from a life that's being lived. I often say that I have one of the strongest marriages in the world, and I, I, I really know that because we, eh, I, I repeat again and again that the last time we quarreled was in 1992, and up to today we do not quarrel. So I'm excited to be speaking today specifically on the issue of communication which I believe really is very important in any marriage. Uh, the way we communicate, if it's toxic, it will definitely spoil everything. Every endeavor, whatever you can do in life, no, no matter how much of wealth you can accrue, as long as your communication with your spouse is not good, it's a, it's a world that will torment you because you will not produce, you will not... Um, work to your capacity because you will be definitely be pulled down by poor communication. So today I want to speak to you about communication as we wrap up this conference and I trust that God will touch your hearts and I know you'll be blessed. Um, so let me just read this key scripture I'm using here which is Colossians 4 verse 6. Um, Paul says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. That, is, that means there's a way of answering each other, which is expected of by God but your speech must be released in grace, in that smoothness, that consideration of each other, so that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Let's just pray. Father, we bless your name. Thank you once again, Lord, in this couples conference. You've spoken to us and you continue to speak to us. Lord, we are attentive. We pray that each 
everyone who is hearing us in this conference, Lord, you transform their hearts, transform their lives so that they can handle their marriages the right way. Exactly what you purposed as you put this very important institution into play right there in the Garden of Eden. We thank you, Master. So we give you this session and we pray, Father, that you will give me revelation knowledge and that you will transmit your heart to your people. And Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be launching from a principle. I believe in principles. I believe that God would want us to flow in his principles that are in his word. Uh, principle is like a law. You know, it's not like a rule. You can break a rule anytime. And uh, you may, not, may even not face any consequences about it. But when you break a law, you, things will just react. You, 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 you will pay for it. You break a law, obviously, you have to suffer and get consequences. You may ask God for forgiveness, but consequences run for a season. And then you are done. If you're confused, you plant more. You go again into another season of reaping. Consequences are so confusing, you may end up thinking, hey, what's wrong with me? You love the Lord, but consequences can confuse your life. So we avoid that by flowing together with God's laws. So I'm launching as I teach this um, evening. I'm teaching, launching from a principle. Um, as I talk about communication, it is from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't change that. You cannot change that. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A law, a law acts in the same way like the physical law of gravity. If you fall, if you jump up, you come down because there's a law that's controlling you. So that's exactly what this portion of scripture is saying. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means we have to work very hard. I had to do that with uh, Mavis from the beginning. By the way, I married somebody who is very intelligent and uh, she right at school, she was, or she was among just three girls who were in our physics class um, at all level. She was just intelligent, so it was going to be a struggle with a woman like that, but I had to learn this, to work on my heart, to make sure that what's coming out will always be seasoned with salt and I'm able to communicate well. When you really, really put this into perspective, you will always answer well, even a contentious woman even a contentious man, because you have worked on your heart. You have allowed the Holy Spirit to work on your heart. And so what's coming out, come on, you cannot bring out orange juice where there is a lemon. A lemon heart will bring out lemon juice. So you work on your heart. The biggest problem is that we always say she is the problem. We jump into that without working on our own hearts. That's the problem. So I'm launching from there. Um, and the Bible is very clear also. It says, guard your heart because from it flows the issues of life. We've got to guard your heart. From it flows the issues of life. And uh, the first scripture that I gave you is from Matthew 12, verse 34, if you are writing down. So... My scripture, Colossians 4, verse 6, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. The arena of communication plays a big role in giving us a strong marriage or a poor marriage. This is the playground where the enemy comes in so powerfully because he knows communication is an interpretation of the condition of the heart. He knows that. He knows that as long as he spoils that area, you will have a very nasty marriage. So I'll take time just for us to go through and understand some dimensions that will help you along as you 
uh, go on with your wife, your husband, some of you in the early stages of marriage, and some of you are just a man, some months old in the marriage, some, you know, two or three years in the marriage. Yeah, you, you, some of you are still in honeymoon. You haven't really touched the real thing. You know, you still, there's a lot of pretense as you go on in the honeymoon. But uh, you see, when reality sets in, that level really can confuse you. This is when you really start to labor on the issue of smoothening your communication. Um, the, the period of our honeymoon, there's a lot of pretense. So, you know, it's when you get into the reality stage, that's when you really have to labor to make sure that your condition of your heart is good so you know how to respond to your partner. By the way, who may be coming from a very contentious family, who may be coming from a family where father and mother fought every day. And so what he or she comes in with the marriage is an atmosphere right in her or his heart of fighting. So as she gets into the marriage, she is just there thinking this man is a fighter and will fight. And so, but when you work your life, you will be you will be shocked how God can change somebody. But if you play to the gallery, then you will definitely create a very, very contentious marriage. And by the way, you'll pass it on to the next generation. We've been given an awesome responsibility in this very important institution of marriage so that we can pass it on to the next generation. It's an awesome responsibility. So no matter what he or she does, please think about this because you have to pass on the right thing. So I will divide this lesson into three levels or three dimensions of communication, which when mastered, will definitely create a strong marriage. Time, talk, and touch. Time, talk, and touch. And I will, you could express these, and that's exactly how I'm going to express it here. You could express them as time communication, talk communication, and touch communication, or physical communication. Or put it this way, time communication, verbal communication, and physical communication. Time communication or verbal communication, just like physical and uh, um, verbal communication, when we talk about time communication, you are speaking. You are speaking. Create time for each other and you open yourselves to the other two levels or dimensions of communication. Just by deliberately giving time to your spouse, I've discovered it speaks volumes. Creating time and you just sit close to her or him and you are just there with him. You are not talking, you are not touching, you are just there, you've created the time. You are not absorbed in something else but you are seated by, you are with her. That's creating time and that's communication. In short, you are saying, I want to be around you and an environment with you, without you, is not a conducive environment. I'm here for you. Whatever you want me to do, I can do right now. I've often do that with my wife when she's in the kitchen, by the way, now, we are only the two of us at home um, during the evening. It's just the two of us. So when it's time for to, to put up, um, uh, to do dishes and all that, she's doing dishes. I'm stand, I'm just right there by her. I don't remember a day uh, from the time when we are just two of us that I've left her to do things and I'm in the bedroom or somewhere. No, I don't. When she is cooking, I know she's alone. I'm not go good at cooking. I'm good at making the bed. I can do that. But when we talk about cooking, I have to sit in the kitchen and not doing anything. 
just talking with her while she's cooking. I've given her that time. I'm being considerate. That's communication. And so I want to believe that Eve was spending more time with <clears throat> more time in the garden. I, this is not written in scripture, but I really feel that Eve was spending more time <clears throat> out in the garden and the serpent got her. I, I, don't, uh, I also interpret it this way. She must have not been spending much time with the husband. And the enemy comes in. Comes in so subtly. So we deliberately create time for each other. No matter what happens. <clears throat> we are just there together. Sometimes we have uh, 30 minutes or so of just seated like this. My wife is a very busy woman. She, she, she wants to be doing things all the time. And so she, but there, there, there are times we just sit and we're just talking. You, you open yourself to the other dimensions of communication, touch and talk because you've created time. These are the C, three T's of marriage that are serious. And so I'm, I'm going to give you some robbers of time very quickly, robbers of time that have been introduced by the enemy in this last day. The first one is the internet. I want you to know that this one, although it has brought in advancement in many areas, it could be research, it could be history, geography, science, whatever you want to get on, you get it on the internet. But I tell you, it has also brought in some disaster, negative advancement. It depends on how you take it cyber crime, sexual perversions, everything, you get it on the internet. You can do a bank robbery on the internet. <clears throat> a lot of things can happen there. You, you can be tempted to be on the internet the whole day. Running around, maybe doing some, um, some, some young people today, they're, they're doing, they're selling money on the internet. They're, 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 go, they're going into cryptocurrencies and all that, and they can be absorbed into that. So, or absorbed in sports, whatever it is, and you will never have time with your wife. This is a robber of time. And worse still, <clears throat> you find that on the internet, there, there is a, a polished woman a Polish demand and young people, even older people go into pornography and, and they're looking at this Polish, I tell you that Polish woman who knows how to do sex does not exist. Does not exist. Now when your wife now undresses to have sex with you and you look at the bulging stomach and, and all that, she cannot match that woman on the internet. So you are delving into a world of fantasies. And that world is a dangerous world. Because when you really now face the real thing, your wife who is aging, you have no feelings for him. Your husband who is aging, you have no feelings for him. <laughs> and that, that time that you are spending looking at these um, pornographic films, you, it's, uh, you, you are being robbed the very most important ingredient that God gave you so that you can be able to go into effective sex with your husband or wife. It's being robbed. So you come to us, you come to your pastors complaining, he doesn't touch me uh, on the bed. I don't feel for him anymore. I, it's because of what you're watching. watching. There are actually some very silly couples who actually put on the inter uh, TV to watch pornography together. Very foolish. You really know, you know that when finally you are undressed, he, he does not even look at you. You are killing what is important in fantasies. So you can be absorbed on the internet and lose everything that's important concerning your marriage. Avoid visiting the internet for anything destructive. For anything positive like education, 
plan your time and always leave precious time for your wife and family. We do that with my wife. Pastors, be very careful. You can lose a, a whole generation. You know, when you're busy with the things of God, you say these are things of God. That's okay, but make sure that you give time to your family. The next thing that I look at is WhatsApp or any communication applications that you can have. Be very careful. These can also rob your time with your wife or your husband. While I stress these are important communication tools and vital to business, business and many other things, over, overuse of them robs your marriage of any chance to grow. So I really urge you, you have to be deliberate in some of these things. Agree on when to check your messages. Let them come in and you've got your time of checking them. You cannot be just there glued on, the, on that and then you lose. Somebody actually says, hey, hey, hey I'm talking to you. You are, you are not even there because you're not giving time uh, and heart to your marriage. Friends and relatives. As you continue in marriage and familiarity sets in, it's very easy to take your marriage as an apple now in the basket. A done deal. I'm married. He's there. I'm married. But you can lose that man. You can lose that man. It doesn't matter he's a pastor. We've seen disaster. Talk to me. We have seen disaster. Men of God. I've had the, the privilege even to discipline men of God, not in our own ministry, who are founders of other churches. Say, son, you can't continue preaching. But the wife was naive. The wife was just thinking, ah, no, it can just, she would go to her parents, spend time there, leave the man, go wherever he goes, does not even care. Get absorbed with friends and forget your marriage. Are you with him when he's running around with things? I trouble my wife, even going to the nearest grocery shop. I always say, Mama, let's go together. Sometimes she says, but I have to do this. Hey, please, let's go together. Because I know every minute that she's close to me, there is that gelling happening. I may not notice it, but it's there. You quickly have to discover the, the desires or what your husband loves, what your wife loves, so that you also flow with them in support all the time. Otherwise, you lose. And so, it's not a done deal until we leave this earth. Some think it's just a done deal, I'm already married, the, she, he paid Lobola, and so to the end, we, we, we don't value time with, with our spouse, we value time with friends and relatives. And I've noticed that whoever you spend more time with will always dictate the direction of your life. Anyone you spend time more with, if you have to visit or entertain relatives and friends, always enjoy the time together with your spouse. And never have single friends. You can have workmates, acquaintances, but not single friends when you are married. You must have family friends. Otherwise, your language is now different. You can be drawn into something that can really destroy your marriage. Your studies or work. You can easily get married to your books or work. It can become an addiction. Remember, when this happens, the oldest institution, which is called marriage, is suffering. And so are your children. In the future, you'll be shocked how your children don't value marriage because their father and their mother never did value marriage. And so, those are some of the robbers of time. You can expand on that. There, there are many robbers of time. But I have just underlined here, just being with her, just being with him is communication. 
not saying anything. You are just there. It's communication. So if you cannot find time with each other in the positive, the devil creates time for you in the negative. Yeah. Carefully plan your daily time for books and work. Always leave time for your spouse and children. You have a responsibility to carry the next generation into a responsible marriage and responsible life endeavors. And that brings me to verbal communication. Verbal communication. So the first one is time communication. Verbal communication. The Colossians 4, 6 has said, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Proverbs 21, verse 9 says, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. It's a torment to live with a quarreling woman, a quarreling husband. Yeah, I consider verbal communication as the most influential of the three, whether positive or negative. Verbal abuse, for instance, is the greatest sole communicable disease in the world today. I want you to know that when we talk about all the cold wars that happened, the, 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 that then grew to full-blown wars. They were bred and fanned in communication, verbal communication, until physical war broke out. In the book of Joshua, the Bible says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. It says from your mouth. That means when the condition of the heart is all right, you have to constantly churn out what is good in the environment of the home. No matter your feelings. I know sometimes you're overcome by what comes into the head. This is a battleground. What comes into the head at that moment, if you just say yes to it, you can bring out rubbish throughout your life. And some of you, it may be the condition of the heart is okay or is almost okay. But you respond so quickly to what comes into your mind. And so what you speak then is coming from your mind. It's the same soul, but it's not from the heart. It's from the mind. And your partner will interpret something very wrongly. That's why some of you end up saying, no, I was just angry. But look, you could have stopped and said, no, I, I'm not giving out this. So what we did with my wife was to make sure, we, 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 when we started, the first three years was just horror. Yeah, it was not good. But we started to learn that we can create, we can start to build up before children come on the scene. We can start to build up this marriage with good words flying all over the home. We can build, seasoned with salt. We can build and start to build from there. When children now come on the scene in the childbearing stage, we are, we are there. When the first child is around three years, four years, because they start to get everything what's happening around them, we have really built something big in the area of marriage through good words. Yes, what you say creates the world you live in. It may take time, but you eventually receive the world you constantly speak. So we had to do that. So here is my advice on verbal communication. A, speak positive words to your spouse. Intentionally, deliberately. Until your heart is tuned to that. Because I know at first you can say, that's not what I'm feeling. That's not what, I know, but you can deliberately decide to do that. Answer good, answer bad with good, verbally. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words tear up anger. So we build with our words, so good words. I love you. I wrote here some, some of this. I love you. It will be well. You are doing very well in this area. 
even in the midst of temptation, to best negative. Mavis and I discovered early that when you concentrate com commending your partner with good words, commending your partner more on what good he or she has done, like you are not seeing the bad, we notice that the, the other part starts to fight hard to do well, fight hard to address the weakness. The problem is you want him to know that he's wrong in this and this. That's the problem. But I had to pay a blind eye many times. And then she started to work on her weaknesses. The same happened to me. Even when she would come down from the pulpit after preaching and she would uh, come down. I know hey, she, has, she has been rushing this message. My wife was, was a fast typer with words when she was on the pulpit the first days. And so she, bah, 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 she would be going, bah, 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 not emphasizing where it's important, but it was just monotonous voice. And so I really wanted to correct that. But I, I didn't want to offend her because in those early days we, we had some clashes here and there. So any direct correction would be misinterpreted and then there would be a fight. So I made sure that I commended her strongly on what she had done well. And for some weeks of her preaching. And then one day, after commending her on the good, I then say, hey, it was just the speed you were going, but you know, if you can just, and then you emphasize, you go up on what you feel is important and wait for the people to respond. So, you know, and then she received it very well. Our biggest problem is you want to correct her in the heat of an argument. Those arguments, I mean, those corrections are falling on deaf ears, ears because what you have proffered first is negative criticism. And so she is not receiving it. He is not receiving it. Let's not waste words in life. Words are very important. So I wrote here, just as busy as you are building that three bedroom room, you are busy building with words. It's amazing. Just as you are laying brick upon brick, you are doing the same thing with words. Even with the best builder in life, you can only, only lay a maximum of 1,000 bricks. Building a house per day, you can only lay a maximum of 1,000 bricks, but yet you can type 20,000 words in verbal communication per day. You gotta be very careful how those words are molded. Otherwise you destroy what you're trying to build. So my counsel there is withdraw back to your knees and ask God to help you, especially when negative words are boiling to come out of your mouth. That's what I did in 1992. And it really helped me. And from that moment, God cut off totally any quarreling in our home. And today, my first daughter one day actually said, hey, Mom and Dad, I don't know what would happen if I marry a, a man who abuses me verbally and physically because I've not seen it here in the home. We, we made sure that when at that point when she was three years, we, had, we were done with that adjustment of two, two different people coming from different backgrounds. We, we were done with a little bit left, but we were done. So when she came on the scene, yeah, at three years, she has come on the scene. She had come on the scene. She was now aware of her surroundings. She found a strong marriage. Bear in mind, when you're in the childbearing stage, you are now planting something that can be a bomb to you in future, in your fruitful stage, which is the last stage of marriage. I believe that's where we are right now. And it can be negative fruit, fruitfulness or positive fruitfulness. Those children who are now receiving your well into the night arguments and quarreling, they will torment you in your fruitful stage 
when you now have gray hair. That's what kills old people, is children. The fruitful stage of marriage is a dangerous one. And so verbal communication plays a big role. So B, not every word that comes into your mind must be said. Don't do that. That's my counsel there. Not every word that comes into your mind must be said. Remember, what is coming into your mind has not yet gone into your heart, into your subconscious. Not yet. It's still here. It's not yet a sin. It's still flying here. You can pull it down before it settles. That's why the Bible says don't sleep angry. What, what, what the writer of Ephesians is trying to say there is when you sleep when you're angry, whatever has happened is now going down into the heart. It's settling into the heart. So you don't joke with things that have come between you and your husband and you've been quarreling and then you sleep like that. You can't do that. And I say, not everything that comes to your mind must be said. Please, it's not everything that is worth saying. You can destroy your spouse faster in verbal abuse than when you, what you could do in any other. Words are powerful. They pierce right through into the heart and leave a lasting scar that speaks volumes about your hatred and your inconsideration. So let your speech be with grace. Have you, have, you, have you come to see that your mind is like a battleground where after an argument, and usually you will never finish it. <laughs> you will never finish it. After an argument with your spouse, and she seems to beat you in, your, in the arguments, even if when you are going to work, driving to work, you are still arguing with her. You are still arguing with him. And thoughts come into your mind uninvited. They flood your minds. You got to deal with them quickly. Like what the Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3. You capture thoughts that militate against the knowledge of God and throw them away. You have to. Say, no, not that one. No, no, not that. No, I'm not going to say it. And she will never know that I was going to say rubbish. I was going to tell her off. She will never know. You will only tell, say it as a testimony in future. You know, on that day, I was, I was going to, but hey, God helped me. That's it. And it, you'll be laughing over it. But it's this edge, the enemy says, say it now. As if it will solve anything. It does not solve anything. So not everything that comes to your mind must be said. You must sieve stuff. Always edge. I'm so sorry. Fight the edge to release everything that comes to your mind. Remember words. Once released, they are difficult to take back. They have a sorry cannot take them back. Never. The damage would have been done. Actually, the next fight will be premised on the previous fight. The words that were said in the previous fight. That's the, the next fight will you carry it from there. Your next fight finds ammunition in the multitude of careless words said before. Words like, you don't think. You are a heap of rubbish. Marrying you was the greatest mistake I ever did. Imagine, you have got somebody you are going to dwell with for life. You are saying marrying you was the greatest mistake I ever did. You are just releasing that. Very careless, irresponsible. And your child children are there hearing all that. And they are going saying the mother, their mother was the greatest mistake of their father. I'm telling you, from there... The next argument is premised on that. Your wife is saying, I, I was a mistake. And, and so whatever good you can bring, even a chocolate you can bring tomorrow, it, it will be misinterpreted as a cover-up. So let's be careful with words. No matter how angry you are, please save your words. 
Can you hear yourself? Empty head. You are too lazy. I'm going, going back to my parents. You know, what only shows me that you were picking this from what had gone into the head, not the heart, is you, you soon come back after two weeks. But you've already planted something that the enemy can use in the next argument. Some of these assertions could be correct, daughter. They could be correct. You married a fool. It's, it's good that could be correct, but to say them is very responsible. You, you better fight on your knees to pray for that fool. So we destroy our own marriages in verbal communication. So here is counsel. Purpose in your heart that you will always fill the atmosphere of your home with positive good words. These become building blocks for a strong marriage. Secondly, withdraw back to your knees and ask God to help you, especially when negative words are boiling to come out of your mouth. You withdraw. Please, there's nothing wrong in going into the toilet. Kneel down. Say, Lord, I don't want this kind of marriage. Help me to speak to my wife. I hope this is helping you. And finally, physical communication. Your actions are the direct interpretation of your soul, the condition of your soul. You may pretend to bring some chocolates for some time, but that physical action, bringing chocolates here and there, will find no traction. Because it's not from the heart. It's not from the heart. Maybe it's from your head. It's not from the heart. So I've discovered you can say nothing with your mouth, but dispatch volumes with your, with your actions. Yeah. I hear people say, I do not say anything. I did not say anything. I, I keep quiet. I'm, I... I or when I'm angry, I don't say anything. I just keep quiet. Keeping quiet when you are angry is actually very dangerous. Why? Because you are actually speaking when you are quiet. You are, you are speaking more when you are quiet. Because actions speak louder. And you, they, they really convey what is in your heart. Pro Proverbs 15 verse 18 says, a wrathful man steers up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. A wrathful man steers up strife. You actually steer strife because basically you are angry. So physical communication ranges from what I wrote here, ranges from remaining silent, becoming moody, refusing to do house chores, Refusing sex, beating your spouse, to leaving your matrimonial home. Those are physical acts. Yet, do you know what? I've also discovered that just by touching my wife's thigh, when I'm reading something, newspaper or something but my hand is on her it's serious communication but some of you you even on the bed you 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 don't want your spouse to be close to you that means the touch to you is not important yet it's serious communication just putting your hand on her shoulder it's serious communication 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. As we continue to behold the Word and fusing with it, we are slowly being changed into its nature. We are becoming Christ-like. The bride is becoming like the groom. In the same way, our wives 
are becoming like us men and depending on what we communicate to them through our physique, they become, they totally become. Show me a woman, I will show you the men. If you want a contagious wife in your home, start to physically abuse her. Over the years, she becomes a contentious woman, fighting you all the way. So here is counsel. Always stop a quarrel before it develops into contention. The best way to stop a quarrel is for you to stop. Physical abuse is fueled by anger. And if you notice anger is now in the level of demonic, please seek counsel and help and seek prayers with your pastor. Because that area, how do you know when you are now breaking things in the home? And uh, you are beating your spouse, you, you destroy furniture, kitchen, and bang doors. Please seek help. It's now beyond. So this is where we are. Time, touch, talk. Time communication. Very important. Verbal communication. And finally, physical communication. Both physical, verbal, and also time communication, all the three are crucial in building a very strong marriage. We are enjoying that marriage. My wife and I strongly believe we are in the fruitful stage of our marriage. If we had planted wrongly, we could be having children. Our daughters could be giving us children without fathers. They're just, they're just there all over. No stable marriages. And uh, we could be reaping right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always like that. Or if you happen to have that because your children have passed on before you and children come home, there will be a joy. But not when children come because there's a divorce. It's not a joy. There is all, it's pain. But sometimes we don't contribute to that, but sometimes, many times, we do. If we look at what your children are now doing, just rewind back to your life and see exactly what happened before. My, my spiritual father told me the other time, he said, when our first daughter had gone a little bit wild, he said to us, if you have put something in her, she'll come back. And that's what happens. That's what happened. She'll come back. So please, young couples, as I finish, young couples, you have the opportunity. Some of us missed those things. You have the opportunity to do it well and plant well for your children so you can enjoy the fruitful stage of marriage. Otherwise, it can be horror, real horror. So I want to bless you today because I was asked to release the benediction and pray for you um, that God will give you a strong marriage. It's my heart that in Faith in God Ministries, every couple will tap into what God gave us. I know the other time I cried and said, Lord, why don't you give us every Every pastor, every elder, every deacon, just good marriages. All our children, good marriages, spiritual children, good marriages. And the Lord said, I'm bringing them so that they can tap in. It's a process. It's not a one day thing. So I'm glad there are some who are doing very well. God bless you. You are really honoring what God honors. A strong marriage, which is a picture of the marriage of Jesus Christ and his church. God bless you. If you can just stretch out your hands, I'm going to pray right now. The Lord God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You shall not die. You will live to declare the works of the Lord. God's purpose is upon your life will never die. I bless your marriages. I speak strong marriages in your life. Whatever there's been, 
the contentions that the enemy has put across in your lives. Father God, I pray that you'll come in by your spirit and smoothen everything the enemy had put in their lives. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll give each marriage that quest and hunger and thirst to have a strong marriage. That between the two of them, the one who is stronger, who stretches further to do the will of God in the midst of a barrage of negatives, Lord, I pray that you will help that one who is stronger so that he or she can start to build something in the partner. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for strong marriages. Because we know with strong marriages, the next generation is guaranteed. Lord, thank you. And I thank you that as you build strong marriages, you're building the strong church. We give you honor. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, peace that surpasses understanding, be with me now and forevermore. Say, I shall not die, but I will live to declare the works of the Lord. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. What an amazing and powerful teaching we've had from Archbishop tonight. Remember, Proverbs 13, 22 says that a wise man lives inheritance for his children's children. We have been given the inheritance. Now we need to pass it down to our children. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. It has been an awesome conference with you. We love you, but God loves you more. From us to you, shalom. Hallelujah. Welcome to our...